Hello, everyone, and welcome to part 62 of the OK's epic linear reread of George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire series. Today, we'll be covering Circe 1 from A Feast for Crows, Quinton 1 from A Dance with Dragons, and Sansa 7 from A Storm of Swords. All three of these chapters cover only three days, 7th to 9th February 300, but they were published in three different books over a period of 11 years. This episode will contain spoilers from all published books in George R. R. Martin's The Song of Ice and Fire series. I'm Nadia, and today I'm joined by Nymeria. Hi, it's uh, Mary or Nymeria on the forums. Varley? Varley Mo Varley. Blue Armor? Ah, uh, yes, this is uh, Matt. Shadow Baby? It's Sleepy Baby. I mean, Shadow Baby. It's Han in real life. And Gaiden? Hey everyone, this is Kevin. Okay, so the last chapter we covered was Student 11 from A Storm of Swords. And the next one is Cersei's first POV chapter, Cersei 1 from A Feast of Crows, which happens on the same day as Student 11, which is the 7th of February 300. And I believe this is Nymeria's. Yep. Um, so yeah, we start off the chapter with she dreamt she sat the Iron Throne high above them all, so... This is it. We have a Cersei POV. Um, so, but the dreams turns to a nightmare because Cersei is actually naked on the Iron Throne and the court with her dwarf brother mocks her as she cuts herself. Um, the return to reality is slow as her maid wakes her and she realizes there are armed men around. Nightmare and real life are intertwined and confused as Night in White tells her about her father, something about a crossbow, it still feels like the nightmare. But no, Tyrion is locked in a black cell, condemned to die today. She will finally be safe, and her children too. She finally recognizes Boris Blount and Osman Kettleblack. Could it be true? Cersei rises, covers herself with her bed, a bedrobe. She asks uh, where the guards were. Kettleblack explains about the secret passage and that Jamie has gone to see where it leads. Cersei is seized by terror at, at the thought of Tommen being in danger and learning that Loras is protecting him doesn't quite reassure her. She orders Boris Blount to go and check that Tyrion is still in his cell and Catherine Black to accompany her to the Tower of the Hands. As she walks up, she realizes what her father's death means. No one is safe. It might be the prelude to another attack in the city, but she's the Lady of the Rock now. No one will force her to marry again, no one will push her away from power, and no one frightens her. They get to her father's chambers, and she doesn't understand how so many people are there already. She doesn't recognize the man that used to be her father. Surely her father had been taller and not as old. Kevin is, is there, trying to pray. She doesn't know if she should weep or cry or be strong. She orders that Paisel be brought, but he has already come and gone. That's when Cersei realizes that they sent for her last. She's furious that they would leave her father like this, and they bring Kyburn to her. She orders him to make her father ready for the Silent Sisters, and then realizes that Shay is there too. She cannot bear the sight of her the whore in her father's bed and leaves the room to order the cattle blacks to dispose of her and that no one must ever know she was there. Jamie comes back up from the sec secret passage, which leads to many tunnels closed by, closed by uh, locked gates. He hugs Cersei and she restrains from kissing him. She whispers that they have to finish their father's work and that Jamie must become hand in his place. A hand without a hand, a bad jape, sister. Don't ask me to rule. Everyone in the room hears Jamie's answer. She means to rule herself, she says, and Jamie wonders out loud who he pities the most, the realm or Tommen. Cersei slaps him and Kevin scolds them for their quarreling as their father lies there dead. Cersei wonders how she could have even thought Jamie could be hand and decides, decides it will be Kevin. She will need men loyal to her to rule because Pycelle is useless and she will need to move carefully with Mace Tyrell. Deep in thoughts of holding power, she realizes that Varys isn't there and Varys is always there. The suspicion is immediate. He must have been part of this. She orders um, him to be found, and uh, but at this moment, Boris Blount comes back because Tyrion is gone. The cell is open, the guards are missing or sleeping. 
and Cersei loses it. He is in the walls. He killed her father as he killed her mother and then Joffrey. He will come for her next. Her legs feel weak. The room starts spinning. It all goes black at the th- thought of Tyrion's fingers tightening around her throat. And here we go. First Cersei chapter. Yeah, the, the beginning of this chapter is just, again, George's horror writing skills. Um, that dream is, is pretty horrifying, where she's getting torn apart by the Iron Sean. Yeah, it's like the the very uh, familiar to a lot of people, I'm naked in, naked in front of everyone nightmare. Uh, I mean, the <laughs> the Song of Ice and Fire <laughs> version of it. And I thought that and the fact that like we see Cersei being really uh, kind of humane, humane here, at least in the sense that she it's difficult for her to wake up and to get back to reality. The nightmare is still haunting her. And um, are we supposed to, is it supposed to help us identify with her more? Because it, it kind of worked for me, but I'm not sure uh, how, how you guys felt. <laughs> I think we needed Cersei's POV because going forward, I think all of the the POVs that were in King's Landing, they're going to start moving away. So we still needed to have someone in King's Landing that could tell us what was happening, right? Jamie's going to go away soon. Sansa's already gone. Um, Tyrion's gone. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. Tyrion isn't there anymore. So George just had to have somebody who could tell us basically what mm-hmm. was happening. Uh, so I think that uh, it almost serves as uh, really to open it up with a dream like he does really gives us an introspective into her psyche whereas right now we see her as ambitious manipulative like and you know just kind of an all in all an awful person but this dream really shows that she still has the anxiety of pa- of having power and what to do with it and um, just like the, the really seated hatred of her brother this is the first time we heard about um, Maggie the Frog's prophecy, right? And how much of a hold it still has on her. We get hints of it, yes. Yeah. I, to me, this is just such a shining example of why she's such a fascinating character. Because, yes, she's, I mean, definitely a bad guy. But she's not pure evil. And, like, I would never need a year on POV ever in my life. There's nothing that his POV could give me. I feel like that would give layers to who he is. He's just, he's pure evil. Like, that's it. But Cersei does have more than that going on. I'm not saying she's a hero in the story by any means, but she's so fascinating to read. She is such a an onion that every layer you peel back it just like i i do want to learn more and it, i'm glad he hasn't killed her off in any way because i enjoy reading her chapters and this stuff is why she's multi-dimensional and i just love like the first thing that we ever get from her she dreamt she sat the iron throne it just sums it all up like her whole yes. existence right there but then yeah, again the with more layers line. to it yeah, I think it's it's fascinating. In in this chapter, we see a lot of her. Like, we see a lot of uh, layers. You're right because it. I mean, one one minute she's almost grieving. Like, she's actually grieving for her father, and she's like, um, uh, "The stars still shone, all but one. The bright star of the west has fallen, and the nights will be darker now." And I I was like moved by this thought about her father dying and now no one is safe and she's unsafe and the the next second she's like what am I going to do to keep myself in power and no one frightens me um, so is she lying to herself? Is, does she really believe that um, she's born to rule? Uh, she's, she's I mean uh, all at once delusional, frightened uh, furious, everything is happening at the same time, and uh, it's it's really, uh, I think she's really an interesting character in that sense. And the way, the way the whole prophecy really wrecked her is incredibly fascinating. Like the second she thinks about Terman maybe being in danger, it's very stri- striking. She's also got such a. Uh... It's funny because she's like, my my father's dead. What a great man. And then later, like, she's like, well, he wasn't that great. 
and and it's like is she really thinking that because she's such a narcissist and self promoter or is it cuz sometimes when you grieve for someone you become so like cried out about it it's exhausting to grieve that sometimes you do start focusing on more negative aspects of their personalities to kind of harden yourself to it and give yourself a respite from just being sad is it's it's a tiresome thing and that's I've always thought that of certain like she just saying that now because it's convenient to her is she really trying to process her grief that way and she's just ah I love her (laughs) <laughs> Not that I love her, but like I love as a character. I was just saying, is she grieving for her father or is the or the power that he represented? Because Tywin was like the pinnacle of like House Lannister. Now that he's dead, he creates that power vacuum and now she doesn't she can't stand beside him and say, Look where I came from, look at what he was. Both, I think. I think she also grieves for the person in her life. Uh, who has always uh, not stood up for her, but but like because Tywin wasn't a really uh, loving father or anything like that. But it's still her father. I think there's still some uh, affection there. It's like the fantasy that abused children create about their parents to help them process it. Like you, you build them up in your mind because it's easier to. Um, like accept that you're the bad element in the relationship than they are. Yeah. Like you can handle yourself, but you can't handle them. So you, you tend to idolize them and then tear yourself down inwardly. Mm. And it's but, this to me, she is just some of his best writing. I think. Yeah. I think that Cersei has this image of her father in her mind. Where, you know, when she sees, when she finds out that she was in his bed, she thinks, no, he never touched another woman after my mother died. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's been uh, how many years? Like 30 years since her mother died? Something like that. And she just has, and all children do, I think, have this image of their parents. And she, and she does too. She worships her father, basically, despite whatever he's, like, despite him forcing her into another marriage. Having forced her into marriage with Robert, she she still does kind of you know she does have this hero worship for her father. But is that more so because it's not because of uh, their relationship? Like he always loved my mother, so he would never ha- have another woman after her. It's more so his reputation and the fact that he we we Lannisters we don't make mistakes that way. Only Tyrion does that, and he doesn't count. Yeah, she does have a very warped sense of reality at times over certain things. Yeah. But one thing she's right about is how Cersei has a lot of hangups about being a woman, but in this in this chapter the misogyny is in, is out in full force. Like she's the last person that they tell that Tywin is dead. Like everyone knows, ev- or even the, all the servants, everyone knows that Tywin is dead except her. Like she's the last person to be told, even though well, she's do- she is technically the queen. Like she's the the, the king is a child. She's his mother, so she should have been the first person. To... Well, d- doesn't the small council have to determine regency? She can't just assume that. Yeah. I think well, no, but the small the council. She is. Well, yeah, but this is the hand. This this is the hand that's dead, right? Right. And she's but, the queen's but... regent. She she yeah. isn't she already the queen's regent? Yes, yeah, she. Right. Yeah. Tywin wanted to send her back, and he never got a chance to. Or what is it, Lord Protector, that helps rule while the kids underage, or? Yeah, I don't think that when they say, when he says Queen Regent about her, I think he more means Dowager Queen. Because yeah. it is Lord Protector, that's the actual regency, that, like, in the sense that we would use that word. You know, I mean, yeah, it's, it's part of the patriarchal system, but but yeah, it's it's kind of basically how yeah, the, the small council would probably choose a new hand, and that person would then be the de facto ruler of the kingdom until Tom and came of yeah, age. But- yeah, but still, it's still. Uh, it, I mean, she still should have been notified earlier. Like everything has happened before they Certainly. she actually gets there. And but not not only that. I mean, everything. The fact that she doesn't know how to act because she doesn't know if she must appear strong uh, or must appear to be grieving. She doesn't. She doesn't really know what um, will have the best. I mean, 
uh, yeah, what will be the best image of her. And she, she yeah, uh, should she be like a usual woman, uh, quote unquote, because obviously that's not what I think, but like crying and, um, and, and weak again quotes or should she be very strong like her father probably was it's it's all confused no i think they made the right decision because she didn't need to be be like it's like something happens at work and you want to report it immediately to your boss and it's like hold on wait a minute let's figure out what's wrong what happened and like they're in the middle of an investigation the mill the second she's brought in she already fucks it up and has one of the jailers killed right Exactly. Like, <laughs> immediately, she does something completely incompetent. So, like, I think it was more of a, let's figure out, let's have something to report besides your father's dead, and he was killed in the privy. Like, let's, like, interrogate a couple people, like, find out if we can, you know, see who did it, and then we can report it. Like, it doesn't have to yeah, be, Yeah, but like... it's, it's her father. Like, have a bit of decency here. It's her father. She has the right to know before the whole castle does. But like, also, it's her father. Like, I wouldn't want to see my father that, that way, regardless of my relationship with him. I was why they told Jamie. But the, thing is, but the thing is, what happens is when they tell her they still haven't done anything with his body, and when she comes to his bedchamber, she has to see it in front of, like, it's not the, just that she has to see her father like that. She has to see her father like that in front of everyone. Well, you know what? It's her own damn fault for being having her room so far off in Maker's fucking hold cast. Hold fast. They got to walk <laughs> well, all the way down there to go get her. <laughs> I think. I mean, it's just I think so far, really. I, I, I think, think that's the problem of. <laughs> yeah. It's building it's design. Yeah. She had to get dressed so that. So hot far away right but was it out of fear built years ago uh, well that that's another again? part where um both tywin and cersei kind of rule by rule by fear and that does not allow you know their guards to really make independent decisions for fear of reprisal mm-hmm. yeah. about the tower of the hand though she thinks she had half a mind to tear it down so which she, she does. Will, she, yeah. Oh, yeah. Does. So, yeah. Yeah. Just noted that. Yeah, she crazy. Um, Bina, had some, Bina had some observations about the chapter. One of them was about the misogyny. And another one was about um, how Cersei shows some concern about Jamie in this chapter. Like some real concern where she's, you know, thinking, oh, he's climbing down a ladder and anyone could be down there. And he only has one hand. And he can't fight. And she's generally concerned about him, which is... You know, which we only see once we get into Cersei's head. But as soon as he says one thing that displeases her, she slaps him and decides that, hey, you know what? I don't want you part of my life or in my council at all. She's so quick to bounce from it's, one emotion to another. In front of everyone, yeah, too. Yeah, it's the... <laughs> exactly. Well, it's Jamie's also wasn't exactly like... <laughs> yeah, but Jamie was, like, really rude. So... <laughs> Yeah, but I think the issue is is also that she expects him to just agree with everything she's saying because that's kind of how he used to act. I mean, like, go and uh, take the white cloak so that we can be uh, close uh, in King's Landing. He has done everything she asked, basically. Um, So, but now he has changed or is changing and she doesn't see that yet. So she's really... What's happening? Why is Jamie not saying just yes to me? That's because we got his POV in a storm of swords and she didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he just found out that he she's um cheating on him with many people. Everyone. Yeah. Yeah, that's and true. We have to remember what right. happened actually in the other chapter. Yeah. So she definitely is like uh Cecily Neville in this chapter, right? The mom of Edward the Fourth. Yeah. Um. Is she? I mean, I kind of. She's super crazy, and then she definitely like her whole thing. Her dynamic later between her and Marjorie is so like Elizabeth Woodville, and her very, like clashing, you know. And then it all turns to shit anyway. Has someone been watching The White Princess? Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've. Uh, I've been reading uh, 
some shit on the War of the Roses because I like didn't know that much about it and started getting curious. Yeah, this this chapter does a good job of kind of like setting up her her paranoia um, and her like slow descent into madness, which is like I think the most interesting part of her her arc for this uh, this book. Um, so it's kind of it's fun to see that hints of you know the they're in the walls and then the dreams and all that other stuff. I like that it comes later in the series too that we don't get one from her until now. I think is a really brilliant choice. Yeah, it was good because you yeah. you've gotten an image of her in your head already. You know what I mean? Like because we've seen shades of her for so long and now seeing her on the inside. At first, you're like, I really don't want to hear anything you have to say. And then I was kind of like, oh, oh, there's more to her than what is on the outside. You see, I, I like how she immediately... Oh, no, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I would prefer if like we didn't have her POV at all and just got news from King's Landing of all the fucked up shit she's done. She, like, you'd just be like, oh, yeah, did you hear the queen burn the Tower of the Hand? Oh, no. And, uh... <laughs> like, wait, what? <laughs> all this that, secondhand that shit. Be fun. <laughs> Less interesting, though, I think. <laughs> yeah, but maybe we'd have the book by now. <laughs> yeah. That, I don't think, I don't yeah, think her chapters really are the that. problem. <laughs> it's, it's more the SO stuff that's probably holding it up. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was going to say, I like how she immediately sees that it that Varys was involved, but then she takes it too far and just starts including Stannis and... I, the ghost of Rob Stark, like everybody is involved somehow. She's not dumb. She's just her logic Paranoid. is lacking. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She actually has pretty good instincts with you know suspecting Tyrion and Varys. Um, she just and yeah, the exactly. Yeah, the Tyrells in, in other cases, yes. And do you think? And this is the point where Varys disappears and he doesn't come back for like another two, like until the and for like six years. <laughs> Yeah. No, not six knew. years. Eleven years. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. Is, yeah. She she also de- um, notices that yeah the Varys is always here. Like where the fuck is he? <laughs> like everyone's here. Like she's quick. Oh, okay. she's just, it is six mm. years. It is six years. This is from a feast for us. Sorry. Right. Yeah, depends <laughs> on how you look at it. <laughs> yeah. But still, this is like the beginning of. Of a feast for crows, and then we don't get him until the very end of Dance yeah. of Dragons, and we don't hear from him at all. Like Varys just disappears. We don't even yes. hear about him in any other in any other chapters. With Varys gone, and like, do you think Kyburn like feeds off of her, like read her as a paranoid, and just was like kind of like I can give you all the things that you need to you know get rid of all your like little you know, neuroses and like feeds off that to get what he wants? Or do you think he just kind of lucked into that position? Oh, let me a little both. Like he definitely lucked into it seemingly in this chapter. It's a pretty um, big coincidence, but then, you know, he, he takes what's given and he uses it to his advantage. Yeah. I think he's loyal. I don't think he's manipulating her in any way. Yeah. He just wants a laboratory. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the things we'll do for funding. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I was wondering, um, do we learn anything new about the plot or anything we don't know already from A Storm of Swords in this chapter? Because we know about Tywin's death and Shay, Shay being killed. We know about um, Jaime being, uh, uh, finding out Cersei was having an affair. I don't think there's anything new here. Other than, other than the Maggie the Frog prophecy, which we just heard about, which is just mentioned here, I don't think there's anything new. Which is quite a huge thing like we have mentioned yeah. is it really the first time we have the words valonkar and stuff like that i well this is the first mu- chapter be, right yeah, so yeah yeah, yeah it has to be. nobody I else knows about like, the prophecy yeah yeah i just feel like we have talked about that about cersei so much already that it it i kind of felt like it must have been mentioned earlier but yeah no it, it can't because obviously only she would think about that right yeah, we talk about Cersei in every podcast where she, even if she has nothing to do with anything, <laughs> now we finally have a legitimate reason to talk about her. <laughs> okay, so anything else for this chapter? I was going to say, with that being said, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> We've covered it. Uh, um, the- listener, 
I direct you to two episodes, one through sixty-one. <laughs> <For further information. laughs> like uh, the only other thing that sprung to my mind was uh with you know finding the the secret passage where i think like at this point i would have put significant resources towards trying to map out all these ridiculous passages beneath you know the walls here because it's a pretty big you know flaw in their security system I think I think Jamie does <laughs> kind of start that off. Like I think in the in the next few chapters we'll see him like he does send people out to just search them like you know where what passages are going to where. Don't they like uh, say like someone fell down a while but they never heard him like stop screaming or like hit anything and like people get trapped like behind the wall and they can't find them anymore and they're just like they hear them tapping or something and. Like, all sorts of, like, fucking horrific shit is going on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That does sound familiar, but I don't know. You know, use some string, man. Like, <laughs> <laughs> It's like the catacombs in France, right? Mm. Yeah. Yep. I, I guess. <laughs> it is funny, though. It's like, okay, you're a royal family, and you have this ancient castle that was built by someone who killed all the workmen. So they wouldn't know the secrets. And then magically somehow you have this one advisor that knows them all. That yeah. seems like a good idea, right? Well, he sends all his little birds down there to map them out. I'm sure he knows where everything is. <laughs> I mean, I'm surprised this isn't the first time it's come around and bit them in the ass real hard. Like, I mean, it's just that Robert didn't like care at all. Right. Um, and then, yeah, and... anything that Targaryens have would, would have been like... You know, burnt or something, right? And like, uh, blood and cheese use the secret passages too, right? Uh, didn't they? Because the guy was a rat catcher and he killed like one of the yeah. Targaryens, like uh, kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they came through the secret passages. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But hmm. and Varys has been around for like many, many years. Like he was one of um, Eris's uh, advisors as well, so he's had time to like figure it all out. Yeah, I mean, I, he might have even found, like, some info on it, too. He used some string, is what he did. <laughs> what is that quote? Like, uh, only the blood of the dragon will ever know the secrets of the Red Keep? So, oh, from yeah, Megor? Var- I was just hinting at Varys being a secret black fire. <laughs> black oh, fire. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now that we are at the crazy theories, um, let's move on. <laughs> so after search- What? After... <laughs> After Cersei 1, we're jumping forward 49 chapters to Quentin 1, or The Merchant's Man from A Dance of Dragons. This takes place on the same day as Cersei 1, which um, is 7th February 300. Um, and I believe this is Blue Armor. Yes. Uh, so kind of as a preface, um, I wrote this as like a conversation between two people, but my voice doesn't really change like that. So just <laughs> know that. <laughs> All right. Oh man, the first new POV chapter in dance. Who's it going to be? Quentin Martell. All right, all right, all right. The Princess in the Tower was a game-changing chapter. Now we'll finally get to see this Dornish plot, you know, in action. Um, You mean the plot that no one knows about because Dorn refused to tell anyone? How's that plan going so far? The only other person who knew (laughs) is Oberyn, who's dead. Um, Arion and all the stand stakes have already accidentally fucked it up um, because they didn't know about it. Um, Viserys, uh, and both the people who signed the secret marriage pact are dead, and we haven't seen the Sea Lord of Bravos yet. Danny will, ne- will never accept Quentin's proposal, for so- and for some reason, Dorne is not working with Varys, Illyrio, or the Golden Company. I mean, come on, man. Like, uh, even though Quentin, you know, failed to win over Danny, um, there'll probably be an alliance down the road because of his actions. I mean, look at the first line of the chapter. Adventure stank. You know, you know, get it? Because Quentin's story is a deconstruction of the hero's journey. Yeah, which might have been more interesting if Quinn was, you know, was a better character than literally anyone around him. I'm much more interested in what Drink, Sir Ironwood, and Tattered Prince do next than the fallout from Quentin's death. Quinn's just like a sad little kid with daddy issues, and we already have John. Um, we'll have to get kind of a judgment from Marie to see which character is more annoying. Fair, <laughs> fair enough, but we get to see Volantis for the first time. I mean, that's an awesome setting. The free cities, free cities have been wonderfully crafted. Their histories are fascinating, and there's a tantalizing mention of the Demon Road. Yeah, this is just what we need: more world building outside of Westeros. 
what the fuck do tigers and elephants have to do with anything? I'm sure that was worth pushing off the two climactic battles to the next book. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't give me that shit. The fact that the slaves outnumber the free, free citizens five to one is super fucking important. They're going to burn down Volantis to the ground, you know, when Danny finally comes rolling through. Yeah, which won't happen until book seven because she has to deal with the Dothrakian winds and that stupid fucking one step forward, two steps back prophecy. Seriously, Quaith, be a better motivator and get Danny's fine ass moving. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> That's all the time we have for we have for this recap as a fight is broken out in the studio. Uh, join us next time when we discuss where all the whores are going, what's the most moral way to run the fighting pits, and how many, many wildlings should be left to die. Scene. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, 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 sir. <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, you, you made an awesome summary for a chapter that has nothing in it. <laughs> this, this is the new Iron Bidet, I can tell. But see, I, I, nothing I, happens in this chapter. Yeah, is there anything really to talk happen. about? It's just like we got a, some information. All right. Yeah, no, it kind of—it's kind of just an extension of the Princess in the Tower chapter, and yeah, there is there is a w- little world building in Volantis, which I personally like. Um, um, but yeah, beyond that, there's there's not much. Um, oh yeah, I guess we we get yeah, you know, I mean we get a little um, history into or telling of what's happening over in Marine as they kind of tell about all the the mercenary companies heading over there and kind of what Danny's going through. But we have a Danny POV and we have a Tyrion right. POV. <laughs> <laughs> right. What? I mean, yeah. To be fair, Tyrion doesn't make it down to Volantis for another like few chapters, but but yeah. But yeah, I mean, he I, does go there too, right? We could have had the world building as a small part of that. We didn't really need a whole chapter. Right. right. You don't need both characters going there, telling us about the political like machinations in Volantis at this time. <laughs> like, okay, crazy elections now, going through. But, like, not to open up a can of worms with like conspiracy theories but this this is why i do like the theory of like quentin's secret switch out and he's not really dead because otherwise this really brilliant author who like Mm. everything he writes is so good and important wrote this character for no fucking reason whatsoever like here's a character you don't care about that goes nowhere enjoy a whole book why even if he's still alive you can edit out his chapters and nothing changes Right, <laughs> it just shows up there. It's like, oh, you. I feel. I feel like I'm. I'm the one who m- m- didn't wanted to recap this chapter, and I'm. I'm gonna be the one who defends Quentin. Oh. Um, <laughs> no, I, no, I actually. I, I don't. Too. I don't get why he's here, but it may be. I still have some notes about this chapter because one thing is, and you mentioned that Matt is like, yeah, no one. They don't work with Varys for some reason. And I think it's interesting to see how many people are plotting with the feeling that they are the only ones with big plans for this or that person. So, because Varys himself is trying to get Fagan and Tyrion to Danny, and Doran is trying to get Quentin to Danny, and it's just, I think maybe that's the only point of Quentin, to just show it's one more person who's trying to get to Danny and to um, offer something to her in exchange for a marriage. Yeah, yeah. Now, I mean, now that we've seen the Dornish plot, like we need to, you know, we need to see like where it's going. And you know, it's it's only four chapters, and I think that's kind of as small as he could have made it. Where you have the first chapter setting out, you have you know the mercenary stuff to show kind of the situation outside the walls of Marine. Yeah. You have them. You have them meeting, and then you have the failed dragon thing. Like I mean, that's yeah. you. You can't cut out any of those those things. I think, I think the reason we're so annoyed with Quentin. I mean, two things. One thing is, he's such a normal person that we are not really interested in him. Is he's like a normal person from the real world being thrown in a fantasy world? So. Of course he won't survive because I wouldn't, so <laughs> he won't either. And he's not that interesting. He's not he's not all flame like Oberyn or um I don't know, an Arya type or sensitive like type character. Or yeah. Exactly. His They're other characters are particularly interesting. No, he's not <laughs> he's not really yeah. Um but I think the other mm. reason why we hate these chapters so much is that 
we are here with our eight, no, seven years frustration of not having the sixth book. And we didn't get to see where this all uh, thing led. Like, it all grows in dance towards something and we don't get to see that, the the big battle. So obviously we're like, what 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 was this? It, it's absolutely no use. So I think the frustration is talking for us here. Well, it's just so weird. It's like it's only four chapters, but it feels like 14, first of all. <laughs> Second of all, yeah. uh what the damn hell is the the point? Like, we didn't need a POV from him to know that he gets his whole big thing is letting the dragons out. Anyone could have done that. Literally. Including him. Any old... Yeah, and we didn't need a POV. We could have we seen, could have like, Arya Hotov getting the yeah. news that Quentin tried to free the dragons and was killed in the process. Done. We could just, Arya gets we could the news of her brother. From- we could just hear it from Barristan, right? Barristan was there. He could have just said, oh, that prince that turned up out of nowhere. He did die trying to, you know, ride a dragon. But I mean, that's, that's probably something happens. that we can say. We, we can say that but, about Yeah, exactly. We didn't need four chapters. So, Maybe we didn't, but I mean, a lot of things could also be uh, told uh, through hearsay and just, oh, this happened and we wouldn't need a lot of... Uh, I mean, the story could be told in a in a in a recap but, if we really wanted something short. So yeah, but um, well, normally I would agree with that. But the problem is uh, when George got to like a feast of crows and a dance of dragons, it just things kind of just spun out of control for him. Like everything just kept kept spreading and spreading and spreading, and he couldn't contain the characters and the number of chapters and the world building and something he needed to do to move the plot forward and I think this was one of the characters that could have been not edited out because he could still have appeared in Mirene but his just story didn't have to be told by his own POV. Yeah I agree probably I mean he was maybe supposed to be more relatable and someone we could uh, identify with for the very few chapters that we have from him but it didn't really work so but I, it uh, feels overall, like overall, I, mean, his, I agree. His his whole like his his story was doomed from the very beginning. Like he's he set out to marry Danny, right? He's and in this chapter, he's thinking, you know, she. Even though I'm not, he's thinking this about himself. I'm not the smartest. I'm not the most good. Like I'm not good looking at all. I'm not, you know, I'm not a typical prince. But she'll honor the agreement. But the thing is, Danny doesn't even know about the agreement. No one does. Like, it, no one does. Exactly. <laughs> no one except Doran, who, no who, who was the who was the architect uh, or architect. Of it. And <laughs> that's the problem with the story. Like it's it's just you can tell from the very first chapter that nothing is going to come of this. Doran, Doran's like, I have a cunning plan. <laughs> <laughs> and and having plan. read and having read Danny's chapters, like she gets attracted, like she's attracted to Dario Naharis, who is a very flamboyant, <laughs> um, extra- <laughs> you know, fl- a very flamboyant character. And Quentin is uh, like the exact to. opposite. There's right, right. no way that Danny would ever <laughs> be interested, and he right, doesn't yeah, even she- bring that. To- Table. She loves no. Dario, which is not really her duty. If it's a two, di- it's two different things. I think she would have married Quentin if she could have, but she was pledged to his daughter, so that that's what stopped her. Not that he looks like a frog. Yeah, at that point, Danny is in Mirin. Her problems are all in Mirin, so she needs to marry his daughter. Right. The, yeah, I mean, marrying Quentin would yes m- make an alliance with Dawn, but that's for the future. It still doesn't. It won't help her get out of Marine, right? So yeah, yeah, Danny she is was real really... in for a penny and for a pound in Marine at this point, mm-hmm. which is also annoying, but we'll not go right. there. She had a Rob Stark situation where she could have turned her back on the her engagement if she wanted to, but at her own peril. And so yeah, poor Quentin. But Why honestly, you like, it just seems like so much character development to be spent on on a one off thing you know on a one-off person that's why to me it's a weird choice to make a pov out of it when it is only four chapters and then he just ends up 
a complete failure. It seems like a lot of work to put in to something that that was your ultimate plan for. And it seems it's either filler or there is going to be something that comes out of it more important later. It's a lack of an editor saying, hey, George, you know what? No, you need to stop right now because you're having problems writing this. It's obviously not needed. So just just get rid of it. But I think at this point he was too big to stop. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I completely agree. Yeah, Do you I think, mean, too, it might have been that he wanted to keep stakes high so he developed a character to kill off? Like, because he's so notorious for killing off characters that people are invested in, but no one else that we're really invested in dies in this book, do they? I mean, like, really? Well, we and, like, kill off one of the... Don't. <laughs> kill off one of the uh, already established POV characters, then. Don't just craft one out of thin air. Kill off Sansa. Why not? No! I'd be good with that. No, why would you I'd use Sansa? And I, we should always <laughs> spin on the same page. I said yes. that on purpose. I'm kidding. Thank you. <laughs> no, but I, I get I get your point, Hannah. Actually, yeah, he has been famous for killing off characters, and the question now is, who can he kill off that he doesn't have big plans for? He won't right. kill Danny. We all know John is coming back. Arya and Sansa are two two very important characters, which bring something uh, else to the story, I think, and that we've been following from the beginning. So obviously that's not a reason not to kill them off, but I don't know if it would be... I mean, I don't know exactly what he needs them for in the end, but I think he does want to keep them. And we have who Jamie and Cersei, who are beginning to get interesting, and that's... And and we have Tyrion. I guess the choice could have been to kill off Tyrion. Yeah, I mean no. he, he just can't kill. He just can't kill anyone until later. Like I'm sure there'll be, you know. A... I don't think he'll ever kill off Tyrion. I don't think probably. so either. But yeah. probably not. He, is, he is killed Tyrion. off. Yeah, the way the way Ned and Rob died were very shocking to us, but also very um, natural Set in up. the story. Yeah. And no one else is quite uh, quite does match that description in in dance. So maybe that was the point of Quentin being someone uh, who would die uh, in the book. But then he didn't develop him enough for us to really care. So exactly, like you don't care about you, four chapters in which nothing really happens is not enough to make you care about a character. Like Ned was the primary. POV character in a Game of Thrones, yeah, which right. is why, like, he was he was the main protagonist of the story, and then Rob was his son, which meant that you know you transfer your loyalty once Ned is dead, you transfer your loyalties from Ned to Rob, and, and so his death had yeah. and Kathleen, yeah, and they all die, I, which is yeah. is you know very tragic. But Quentin, you don't really and. And the thing is, Quentin is basically part of the Dornish storyline. And the Dornish storyline has basically just been introduced. So well, you're, not, you're not as invested in that storyline either, that you would care about Quentin's death. Mm-hmm. Even though I agree, I, I mean, I like, I really enjoy the chapter in which Quentin dies. I don't enjoy it the way he dies. <laughs> but <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a pretty cool chapter, like, you know, where he, where he goes to the dragons and he tries to you know, bribe them basically into being able to write one. That it's a great chapter. But the thing is we we just even at that point we haven't seen enough of Quentin to, to mm-hmm. just care. Do you yeah. think because the other thing is he could have just created something to pepper in simply because he wasn't doing everyone's POVs all at once. You know, these two books are yeah, one that, book that is split up. Yeah, I th- I think you hit the issue there where if if Danny's storyline and the Dornish storyline were in the same book, then yes, you could have cut out Quentin, where you would just flow the Princess in the Tower chapter into a Danny chapter of her meeting Quentin. But because they were in separate books, he had to kind of include um, his backstories because it had been so long um, between them that you couldn't just have him randomly showing up at, you know, three fourths yeah. of the way, way into dance when you're just like, who the fuck is this guy? Oh, it's that or guy. Because, that because, like, he yes, just introduced again. it all in the last book, and then he, he's not revisiting Ariane in this one. 
So throw in Quentin to kind of remind everyone about that, maybe. Yeah. Keep it fresh in a way. But still, I mean, I agree with you, Nadia. It just seems like, but still, why? I don't. Yeah, see, but the, again, that's those are editing problems, right? The, the, George needs a new editor. <laughs> well, yes. and again, so we don't know. We don't know where it'll end up. I mean, we could all look back on this in 30 years and go, God, we were so stupid. It's like Quentin was the biggest thing ever. Yeah, I don't think that's happening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'd be happy if that happened because it meant that we have, uh, we would have another book. But <laughs> it also mean I'd live another thirty years. Oh, come on. Yeah, that would be great. Right? <laughs> We're aiming high on VOK today. <laughs> another thirty years. <laughs> oh fuck. All right, well, let's just say, no matter where okay. we are, we'll all meet back here in 30 years. I'm disgusted. <laughs> <laughs> Get some wet, hot American summer over here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, so moving on. Since nothing's that, unless Mary has something to say. It's a very small thing, just that I felt like this was a very classic kind of writing for George. Like, he he's writing a chapter, and he... There's just a plot twist right at the end where we, we're we waiting to know what's going to be revealed and then the next Quentin chapter, it will have happened, meaning that they will have enrolled with this or that company. And it's all brought up by, I mean, it's all very clear with the windblown recruiters just before. So I feel like that's also an issue here is that it's just, it's a way of writing which works very well but it's like the, I mean, he's done that so much already uh, in these first books that we're kind of like, okay, another kind of cliffhanger at the end of the chapter, except that we don't really want to know what happens because we will forget it uh, the second we turn the page probably. So Yeah, I mean, I, I remember also- the first time I read this, I, I remember reading this chapter and all of these characters were just brand new, right? All of these mm-hmm. um, uh, self-sort companies, all of these new Ronish characters, they, they were all new, right? There's only so much information you can pack into your brain. And then there are like a hundred other chapters, hundred other POV chapters, and then you get to a Quentin chapter, and then it's like the windblown stuff has already happened. And I had to go back and figure out what was happening because I couldn't, like... I couldn't make out what was happening. It's just, it's just a lot of information. And for a new character, that's just, it's just kind of hard to, you know, get involved. You just want to move on to the next one. Yeah. I think Matt, you touched on something important in your recap though, about Volantis being important later too. Oh so yeah. So that Quinn does serve a purpose to uh, show a little bit more of the dynamics there. Because I I believe that it'll be important for her journey. I don't think it's going to be where she just skips over. But I think. But I think Tyrion shows us. Doesn't Tyrion show us a better view of Philantus? Like he. Yeah, because he 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 talks to that woman. He actually talks to some of the exactly. He talks to that woman, and she says she actually says something relevant to Danny. She says that when you get to her, tell her we're waiting for her, and that's I think that's a much better way to show us Volantis instead of in a throwaway characters chapter like yeah that's true he's just so I feel like Quentin Quentin needs that like whammy (laughs) sound following him around the whole time like (laughs) 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 every little movie thanks poor kid okay so anyway I think we're just saying the same thing over and over again yeah yeah I think move on to the the most important chapter Yes. yes, my probably my favorite chapter in all of the books. Anyway, um, so after Quentin won from A Dance of Dragons, we are jumping back. 54 chapters, two books, 11 years of writing to Sansa 7 from A Storm of Swords. Um, this happens on 9 February 300, two days after the events of Quentin won. BOK did a full castle recording of this chapter a long, long time ago on BOK 100 and it's it's really amazing stuff and if you want to listen to 
recording of the chapter please go back and listen to that one it's it's really good and um wiley is going to summarize this for us all right so i was trying to like think of a theme or some way to present this um I was thinking it was kind of like uh, Beethoven's Sixth Symphony, just by the second movement and the fourth movement, uh, and the way that the kind of chapter begins with this like beautiful scenery, talking about nostalgia. Sansa wakes up and she thinks she's uh, they she's had a dream of home and of Winterfell and of Arya sleeping, you know, sharing her bed, but she realizes she's in the Eyrie. But she gets all this uh, nostalgia for Winterfell and the snow that starts falling reminds her she says it tastes like Winterfell she's reminded of their last day of leaving Rob Stark and having uh, snow melt in his hair um, of snowball fights with the kids in the yard and she's packing snow in the Erie and like well there's no one to have a snowball fight with so she starts building and building and building and she realizes she's building Winterfell and she b- makes the big keep and the old keep or whatever that brand fell off of and she keeps on thinking about it and she gets all flustered when she can't figure out how to make the bridges and then it turns out that peter's there and peter's like gives her a little direction he's like use sticks dummy and she does and uh she makes the bridges and then the glass uh gardens and then he says oh i'm gonna kiss you uh your perfect little uh, snow cub or whatever and so he gets really creepy and kisses her and she's like ew uh don't do that and before he can progress any further uh robert earring comes out and and you know does the best little cock block ever and then breaks down her castle with his doll she rips the doll he goes into one of his fits and she goes uh well you know at least joffrey was of sound body so um so later on, Marillion comes and uh, brings her to Liza Aaron, and Liza goes fucking mental. So, uh, Sansa th- originally thinks that she's in trouble because she made Robert Aaron start shaking or broke his doll or whatever. But no, it's because uh, Liza saw Peter kissing Sansa in the courtyard. So then she has to defend herself, and then Liza's all drunk and's like, "Ah, oh, you're just like your mother. She seduced him too, but it's always me. It was me who loved him." And then um, so she drags her over to, to the moon door and shows her. She's like, "You want to leave now, bitch? Like, you know, you're like, why are you trying to steal my man? Like, and then uh, and then Peter comes in and he's like, "What the fuck's going on?" And then uh, Liza breaks down even more and it's like, "Oh, remember when I like poisoned my husband because you told me to say, uh, do it, and then you told me to write to the Lannister to my sister saying the Lannisters killed." them just so you could start all this fucking war god damn it this whole fucking <laughs> thing started because of lisa aaron oh! <sighs> so then uh peter says that you know don't be silly i've only loved one woman in my life and that was cat and pushed her out the moon door the end <sighs> oh fuck <laughs> oh my god this chapter <laughs> that <amazing>. was that. <laughs> I, it's just so uh, I don't understand what Peter's game was because he alludes to like you know his animosity of the Starks and how he dreamt of Winterfell when Cat left there. But then like was it revenge against Brandon? Well, Brandon died a pretty horrific death. Okay, so he oft ettered like, but he set the entire realm to war. Couldn't he have just done that by letting John Aaron? Let Robert Baratheon know the true parentage of his sons, and then the Lannisters and the Crown would be at war. Like, I, I, it's just so mind-boggling that she was so stupid. She says like she never wanted to be used as a tool again after uh, they aborted her baby, and then was immediately used as a tool that set off all this fucking motion. And now there's no fucking Starks left, and now Roose Bolton's in fucking Winterfell, and all because she wrote the fucking letter to Kerr. <laughs> 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 I think it's not he began really to her hate fault, the nobility. Though. It's not her fault. It's Kat's fault. Oh my god. <laughs> so I'm beginning to think it's not as much of Kat's fault. Also, why didn't she just fucking kill Tyrion? What the fuck was that whole trial about? She knew that he was innocent. <sighs> <laughs> I, I gotta say that, that yeah, the whole have to be together. <laughs> Yeah, why was she so so mad at Tyrion? I don't know. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. To throw suspicion off herself, even though there was no suspicions. But when you're paranoid, (laughs) 
Yeah, like she's like, a little bit schizophrenic, right? Like there's some weird shit going on. Well, he was Terry was going to stay in the sky cells until he asked to come out to talk to her, and I think once he started provoking her, you know her twisted mind, she had to show him up by allowing him to. She allowed him to manipulate her. I think that that's the problem mm-hmm. there. Yeah, I just and got I this my like when someone shit talks on you and you get ready to fight and you take off your earrings. Only she like detaches her five year old kid from her breast. He's not shy if he's eight. Eight, yeah. Oh, well, better. Going that makes sense. Was like eight, eight going on three. That was yeah. That was a great line in the chapter. Um, <laughs> if, if she did kill Tyrion, she would have had the Lannister army at her door, and Tywin would have burned the Eyrie to the ground. Um, so it actually was. A good decision not to kill Did he Tyrion. Though? Yes, not not because he liked Tyrion, but because of the honor of his house. No, yeah. I mean because it's impregnable. The only way it ever fell was with a fucking dragon. Right. Sorry, I didn't mean the eerie. I meant the the veil. Like he would just, you know, he wouldn't try to um, actually march up to the eerie, but he would still, you know, invade the veil if he landed on the eastern shore. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure that. We can really try to understand why Littlefinger did all of this. I'm not sure there's uh, much sense in 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 this. Anyway, it just makes no. a great story, but like, why? I don't. Know. I feel like I he started to Peter, hate the Highborns. Doesn't at some point Peter say that he just loves chaos? Yeah, like he's not even concerned show. about who brings down who. Oh. Um, I'm not mm, sure. I I'm think... not. No, I think he talks about it a little bit with Sansa. Yeah, uh, like yeah. when they're on the ship going to the Fingers. I think there's maybe a conversation looking like that. But at the same time, a lot of what he does is to try and get Kathleen or Sansa back, uh, or mm-hmm. at all. Um, so oh. I think also the the whole John Arryn uh, dying. And writing to uh, writing to Catelyn in Winterfell was like trying to stir some shit to just maybe like indeed cause trouble, but also in in I don't know how, but uh, bring Cat closer to him. Like yeah, just the seem... idea that imagine if Cat had gone with Ned to um, to King's Landing, like. Maybe that was the goal, just bring Cat closer. Hmm. Yeah, I kind of yeah, that's, I I mean, that's think that so makes stupid. a little bit. Yeah, but he's stupid about all of this. I mean, I mean, he's not stupid, but the, his obsession with Cat is just incredible. But that would be like, like two countries that are separated by an ocean barking at each other about nuclear war, and then like a fake uh, nuclear message going out to a set of islands that lie between those two countries. It's mm-hmm. just, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> I love the mm. metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> but more than the more than the Lysa stuff in this chapter, because there's a lot of like Lysa pretty much tells Sansa everything. Sansa, Sansa yeah. obviously doesn't understand it because it's not like she doesn't. It's, come yeah, out it's, it's and say I killed John Aaron, but it's yeah. She all the information is there for her to figure out later. Yeah, it's it's but meant she, for does, us. Does she? Well, she hasn't figured it out yet, but I think she will because I think I mean, Peter it... Peter kind of like lets little tiny bits of information slip sometimes when when his guard is down. I think she'll eventually figure it all out. Like, we haven't seen it happen yet. It's, it's not what is coming. what is. What is there to really figure out? Like the question is more: Is she going to do something using that information? And at at the moment, she hasn't used that information, but it doesn't mean that she hasn't uh, like we don't that she it doesn't remember it. It's it's not time to use it. Like yeah, that's, that's like some, right now something for down the road. Do? Yeah, she 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 can do much with the information that uh, Lisa and. Peter had uh, a child when she was uh, before she was married, and that uh, it would, she she was forced to abort it, and all of that doesn't really hasn't really any impact on the story right now. Uh, I mean, it has on the 
psychology of the characters, but not a, on the intrigue. And the whole thing with John Arryn, she hasn't really had the uh, opportunity to use that stuff. Well, yeah, and she she also talks about how she sent that letter to Catelyn, lying that the Lannisters had killed John Arryn. But yeah, I mean, even 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 if that information is no no longer relevant, like it doesn't matter who killed John Arryn, the war has already happened. What's fascinating to me in this chapter is all this all the Sansa stuff. Like, oh, you mean the first half? Yeah, the first half of this chapter is just it's it's beautifully written, yeah. and it's we can just in a lot of people accuse Sansa of not being enough of a Stark, but this chapter is like yeah, full on like Winterfell. Exactly, she's constantly thinking about Winterfell, about all the good times she spent with her family, and you know this this one line where she accepts everything that's happened to her, and she says, you know, uh, the day she thinks about the day she left Winterfell, and she thinks, you know, I thought my song was just beginning, but it was almost done, and that oh God, is yes. like the saddest thing you can possibly hear from a thirteen-year-old. Like yeah, I. I... Like <laughs> I noted that too. It's just, it's very dark. I mean, it's like, it's it's very dark for her. Yeah, but but at the same point, it's kind of hopeful. Like when she makes a snarky comment to Peter Baelish about how he brought her to um, the area instead of taking her home, she, yeah. she, she thinks, where did I get the strength? And she's like, because I'm within the walls of Winterfell. That's why I'm so strong right now. And yeah, it's this- just kind of amazing to see her kind of like re-accepting her, her Stark identity. Yeah, and we also see her in this chapter, like what you said, she she tells Littlefinger off. She also, like, just with uh, Robin Aaron, she's like, stop, like, just, uh, she doesn't, she starts to react to things and not just letting them happen to her. And she doesn't let herself be insulted or hurt anymore. And that's the same with Lysa. At first, she's like, no. She, I, I didn't kiss him. He did, and she she refuses to lie until yeah. until she realizes how crazy her lies he is, and she will not hear anything uh, of what she's saying. But so yeah, it's um I agree that it's it's the beginning of the it, it's the beginning for Sensa actually right now. She's going back to being to being a Stark really. I mean, she was all along, but now we see it a bit more. There's this uh, prophecy about probably Sansa where it says, you know, this maid in a castle killing a giant. Mm-hmm. And in a castle made of snow. Yeah, yeah in a yeah. castle made of snow. And this is this is basically just a reenactment of that prophecy. Like, there's this yeah. doll. And, she, and the, sticking the doll's head on a spike was kind of dark, even for Sansa. Like, for Sansa, it was... Yeah, especially for Sansa. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to see that. I like Sansa as a character. But do you guys think that the yeah, prophecy like has already been fulfilled, or...? I thought that was it there. Yeah, it's hard to say. Some people think yeah. it's Littlefinger as the titan of Bravos. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that theory. I, I hope that's true. Yeah. I mean, it, it's terrible, but the beginning of that scene, when he just comes in and is like, you should use sticks, and it would help you, and they are building this castle together. It's actually quite sweet if you don't know what little finger take it to thinking. the pervy place all right yeah, yeah exactly if you finger. just if you just imagine little finger being more of a parental figure to her it's all right you know it's it's, it's sweet and then ew it, he gets all flirty and creepy and yeah but and she's like what is happening yeah she even says it's, it's gross because like, you reminded know her of marillion yeah and his like little rapey ways yeah mm-hmm <laughs> I mean, no matter how his kind he's being, like he hates, he killed her father. So, like, even if he's being as sweet as possible, I, I just hated the interaction from the start. Yeah, obviously, but I mean, um, well, first of all, she doesn't quite realize that uh, Littlefinger was the reason Ned died, um, and and yeah, but if if you don't, if if it's just a random character and not Littlefinger, it's actually sweet, and it's it's someone being nice to Sansa in a way that Liza isn't, that no one else is really. Everyone, I mean, even even also, that's true of Littlefinger as well, but everyone sees her as just a pretty thing, good to be married, to gain some power. And that's so sad. She's just so used to being 
undressed by Marillion's eyes, like she says, like he undressed her with her eyes, with his eyes, but she was used to that. That's just awful to say. And everyone just wants her to gain power. And that's really, really sad in this chapter. She's like, it's now that she's starting to to think, I'm not going to be just that. Well, I mean, Tyrion was kind to her with no ulterior motive. She just couldn't see it because of who he was or who his family is. I think she recognized that, though, that, I mean, she still didn't like him. Like, in the end, I think she does, but she also never, I don't think, second guesses the fact that she was so cold to him. And he, like, she never gives him credit that it wasn't his idea to get married. He is... He could have taken her and it wouldn't have been rape in their world. You know what I mean? Like it wouldn't have been done anything wrong. People were encouraging her, him to have his way with her and he respects her and her privacy. And she, I don't think ever really in her heart gives him enough credit for that. But it was his idea this chapter to marry she her. It didn't figure out that this is what's going to happen because this is the yeah. next logical move. But it was Tywin's idea. And he could have refused, but where would that have left her? That's what I'm saying. They wanted her to marry, but that would have been fine because he was a bed. He could have never bedded her. So they would have been married in his room. He could have never consummated. So that could have saved them the embarrassment of the whole bedding procedure and a lot of other things if he would have just let that happen. But doesn't in his in his chapter about it, doesn't he like make some internal comment about I better keep her close because I'll be able to protect her and he wouldn't. They could do whatever well, that's they because wanted with her. And Joffrey would have been able to get at her. but not He has some sort period. of selfish thoughts like I I could, that she comes with Winterfell. He starts seeing that as it being an attractive thing. Like he never wants to harm her in that way, but it he invents this sort of like love triangle between him and Sansa and Shay because he decides that he loves them both somehow. So I don't I. I feel like he looked at her as an object of... He had alter, ulterior motives there. You think? Hmm. I don't know. Maybe. Like, and he, and even Littlefinger in book one. Now, go ahead. Oh, I'm just saying, I, I I appreciate what you're saying. I don't want to totally shoot it down. I just... I guess right. I am more of a Tyrion, like, forgivist. Is that... Does that make sense? Like, not apologist. Because you don't really have to... <laughs> well, you don't have to apologize for anything <laughs> that he does. But as a reader, there are... I know that there are a lot of people who think that he just turns like a, into a complete shit bag in the next couple of books. And I don't really think that way about him. I just think it's a, a combination of poison that he's been drinking for so long. And, mm. you know, it, like, it he, still doesn't mean his actions aren't shit bag actions. I mean, we get where he's coming from. Like we, I mean, yeah, I guess that's the true. abuse that he's taken his entire life, you know, caused him to kill not only, the woman he perceived to love, but also his father, who, you know, was basically the fountain of most of that poison. Um, but, okay, but here's the thing is, like, that is a total crime of passion, and he couldn't not kill her. Like, I, he did not go up there gunning for her, and I don't think that even if he was like, I could forgive you for that, he couldn't leave her alive. He couldn't leave a witness. That's true, but the way he thinks about these things afterwards, he makes himself out to be an innocent victim. Like, even in the moment... He never acknowledges that she's fighting against him. It took me like a reread to see that, wow, she's beat, punching him in the face and he sees yeah. it as like moths floating at his eyes or something. I don't well, know. I mean, she is being killed. <laughs> One will do that. Yeah. Being I mean, that's kind of what we were... I mean, you can put that in perspective to what we were saying about Victorian killing his wife and the way he thinks about it uh, in in the last reread I I did. We were saying that one of the issues was that he thinks about it like, I mean, Alex was saying that uh, most precisely, that he was thinking about it like that happened to him. And that's also what Tyrion is thinking. She she was there and he had no choice. When she had no choice, right? Too like, yeah, that's true. But she, she really is an innocent victim. And well, Victorian Victorian's also stupid enough to believe like his hands actually killed her. Like it was like, ah, oh, my <laughs> yeah, hands no, beat her to death. I'm not. I'm not completely saying that. I uh, comparing Tyrion and Victorian, but but we have but to if, like you. 
I agree with. I, I mean, I I understand what you're saying, Hannah. But sometimes you should. We also uh, see things tr- through the love we have for our character at the yeah, beginning of this, obviously. So, but anyway, Tyrion isn't even in this chapter. <laughs> um, I had um I had a thought actually that I mean it's coming back to the John Arryn uh, revelation, but I think. So that's the last uh, chapter in A Storm of Thought be- uh, before just the epilogue. And combined with what we learned in King's Landing and the fact that Joffrey was behind uh, the attack on Bran, is, it's two, uh, two of the biggest plots in A Game of Thrones. Like Those were the big questions, who killed Jon Arryn and who attacked Bran or uh, uh, ordered the attack on Bran. And now we know, and it's been resolved. So that's like very neat. In the end of a storm, uh, a storm of swords, uh, that we have all of these revelations. Yeah, it's like a drunken like uh, exposition, like vomit diarrhea situation. Like it just <laughs> came at you so quickly. It was like, wait a minute, what? What just happened? What? And then you did what? what? And you're just Uh-oh. like. It, yeah, I like the scene. And then he pushes her out the moon door, and you're like, what? <laughs> we're, we're at the bottom. He leans down the singer. You're like, what? <laughs> It was very shocking. And so cold and so cruel. I mean, yeah, so creepy, little finger. Like, three pages ago, he was all sweet with Sansa, and then he kisses her, and then he pushes his wife out the door, all the while saying, um, I only loved one woman, and that was Kat. I mean, not only he kills her, but it's just he's being the most cruel he could be just before that. And also, yeah, now he, he's literally killed or had a hand in killing, like, two of the people that he has loved or professed to have loved him. Mm-hmm. And somehow he still gets Sansa to trust him. <laughs> I'm not that sure that she does Stockwell trust him. Baby. That poor girl. That scares me. <laughs> but yeah, the, at, this, well, Sansa... at, at this point, just look at this scene. Uh, Lysa was all crazy and pushing Sansa off the moon door. And... and it must have been so scary and, and traumatizing. I mean, can you imagine, really? And he comes in and saves her. So it's horrible. He's the fault good guy. I mean, it's ho- horrible, everything he does to Lysa. To, but in, in this moment, he's the one who protected her from Joffrey and then from Lysa. Yeah. yeah. But he also ordered Sardantos to be killed, like right in front of her. I don't yeah. Know. She, she still has to play the long game in this scenario. Like she has more agent agency now that she's left King's Landing, but she's still not completely free. Yeah, I think I think she doesn't really trust him, but I, at least she trusts that he doesn't want to hurt her in the end. So she doesn't trust him, but she's not quite afraid of him. She has some kind of power over him too. She realizes that so. I would like a POV ca- uh, chapter of her where she is digesting everything that's happened. Like, where she, she. I mean, it has to happen and wins, right? right? She has to be able to like look back and be like, "Oh, yeah." Or like something happens where she finds out that like he held the knife to Ned's throat. Mm. That, that puts everything together. You know, there has to be. I mean, she can't be that stupid. She just can't be. No, no, I don't think she will. Yeah, though. I think yeah, it's, it's, I think it's yeah. really more complicated than that. Just she is stupid. I mean, I think everyone. But she has that unreliable narrative thing going for her. Yeah, she's not stupid. She's just a no. she's a child who sometimes doesn't remember remember things very clearly. She's she's not. It's not that she's stupid. She does understand situations really well. And she understands people. Like she can tell what people are are feeling, what they're thinking. Is she sad because she is a child that has childlike ambitions? Like, she, okay, she wants to be queen. She wants to be a princess. But really, that's very simple. That it's a very simple motivation. She just wants to have a nice life, you know. And that's like the exact opposite of everything she gets. So what she should start doing is wish for a horrible life, and then maybe she'll get a nice life. (laughs) Or she'll be content with the horrible life she currently has. And be like, well, yeah. Uh, It's just my fear that this is the last Sansa chapter ever, and she's going to commit to being Elaine Stone, because I should just shrug off that old identity, because it never did me any good. So let's start over. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. 
Right from out, yeah, I think she'll, but she'll eventually meet up with other Starks eventually. Yeah, I think Sansa is the one like who's probably not going to die. Like, she yeah, just I think seems she, to be I would say like, she's guaranteed. Yeah, she's I kind have of a like that she survivor who gets die. to it. Yeah, I, I think she's going to die because her wolf is gone, and I think that only the people whose wolves are still alive will be the ones that live in the end. No, mm. I have a feeling that Arya is the one that's going to die, and Sansa is the one that stays. <laughs> I mean, Rob's, Rob's wolf was di- was alive when he was killed. Like <laughs> they so were killed John's. together. That no. John's wolf is alive when he's killed. That like uh, come on, get get real about that. I mean, yeah, Jadon will be brought back, but that he did die, right? Yeah. So that's Dude, the until I see it in the book, he is dead. <laughs> exactly, right? His, his ghost is alive and John is dead. That's pretty simple, right? Mm-hmm. The wolf mm-hmm. being dead isn't really, like, that's more of their relation to their Stark identity than actually being alive or dead. You, But we also haven't actually seen that he's dead in the book. He just got stabbed the shit out of. That's oh, not Colin. the same. There's, there's, <laughs> you don't no, that. Mostly dead, you guys. He's mostly dead. Is not all dead. <laughs> there's, there's no need to rehash those. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anyone else? Look at that. A tight hour and a half. Yeah. Hold on. Let me just check. Let me just check Dina's notes. She had, she had a lot of stuff. Oh. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. God damn it, um, Dina. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just checking if there's anything we haven't covered. Um, she wants to talk about Sansa's de- is about how Sansa might be depressed. Uh, yes, I, I can see that. <laughs> yeah, join the fucking club, Sansa. Jesus, what did you say? I didn't catch that. What's next? About <laughs> whether Sansa is depressed. depressed? Yeah, there's this. Uh, I think the first sign of that we see is in Game of Thrones when she um, tries to uh, jump uh, out of the window to kill herself but after her father dies. Yeah, that's the mm-hmm. suicide attempt is a good, good indicator of depression. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? She thought about doing it, but she she didn't do it. Oh, well, so yeah, but serious. she was having suicidal thoughts. I mean, that's. Well, that's true. So, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think we can really uh, uh, argue that Sansa is not depressed. Everything that has happened to her, it's just, I mean, so horrible from the beginning. Her father, then the months spent in King's Landing being basically abused by Joffrey, uh, and then Rob's death, and then all Dude, of that. Wh- what about the Riverlands that were just burnt and tortured and, like, like run over like three times by two different armies yeah, because I, of this I, fake I, fucking letter that Lysa wrote to Cat in the beginning of Game of Thrones. And I didn't say that the people in the Riverlands were not depressed. They are, probably are. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone is depressed. I mean, look at what is happening. Uh oh, woke the dragon. Matt's about to twist somebody's nipple. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> okay, so uh, yes, uh, so, uh, Sabina's question. Next question: um, Do you think Catelyn really did lead Peter on? I don't think she no. did. No. Yeah, she, Catelyn always remembers him uh, as her little brother. I, I think it was always Peter kind of having a crush on her, but she didn't respond at all. Lysa just seems to remember that you know. Peter always wanted her, so she thinks that. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I think we had this conversation on a previous reread, uh, like the chapter where she's like, "I remember making him eat mud, and he did, and it was like uh, he was sick in bed for two weeks." It's like that's not mm-hmm. teasing, like playful turn on kind of teasing. That's like <laughs> like brother sister growing up and being shitty to each other teasing. Yeah, yeah, I agree, and I mean. I, I don't know about you guys, but I've certainly been in a st- situation where I had a crush on someone and totally misread some things. And I guess it's kind of that here. Like, Kathleen, I don't think Kathleen ever really, uh, l- l- yeah, lead Littlefinger on. It's really all in his head. 
Do you feel like he's got and, some weird, sick, like, Norman Bates shit going on where, like, he stole one of her dresses, put a red wig on, and, like, talked to himself in the mirror? <laughs> well, not, not now. <laughs> <laughs> not that far. <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe stole like, some clothing, but... Or maybe had, like, one of his whores, like, wear one of her dresses or something. Oh, like, mo- yeah, oh undoubtedly, he had, like, a Catelyn lookalike whore. Oh, like, yeah. That, that no way. Yeah. Call me the tire. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> all right what's up okay what so next Bina question next Bina question did peter uh, did peter always plan to kill lysa and this was as good a time as any oh hmm. that is it. yeah hmm. yeah probably i would say so i don't because yeah, yeah she was probably, but this is too more volatile messy. yeah i wanted to deal with probably yeah, yeah she, she let all the cats out of the bag, so he had to kind of do it now. But yeah. I don't see her living much longer, but I don't think he would do it in front of Sansa and the singer. All like the cats the out of the bag, or... pun intended? Yeah. Or... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hate myself. Yeah, she was, she was certainly yeah, a loose end. He probably wanted to square away some of the Lords of the Vale before he did that and yeah. make it a little cleaner so there wasn't going to be any real questions. Yeah, I mean, because as long as Lysa's alive, his legitimacy as protector of the veil or whatever the fuck his title is, like, is stronger. Instead of now, it's like, well, now what connections do you have to this at all? Right. Mm-hmm. I think I, I, like, I do think he was planning to kill her at some point, and but I also think it, it, he really didn't mean to do it this early on, and that he reacted to Lysa threatening Sansa. I mean, well, he yeah, obviously and he has re- tried low profile over there anyway. Like, they know he's there, but they don't know he's got Sansa and all that shit, so... Yeah. He's trying to... I mean, he obviously reported his uh, obsession for Catelyn to Sansa. So, I think this is this is a reaction and not a really a decision to do it just right now. It's because, because of what, what is happening and Lysa clearly is losing it so he just he reacts although one could argue that he went out there and kissed Sansa in the snow knowing that Lysa would see knowing that she'd react this way in some way I was and just thinking did it that this way to justify it to oh, Sansa it's I still mean, too messy like I in th- the view of the veil because yeah. why would you risk doing that right now if you, yeah. if, if and unless you had a plan. Yeah, it'd be much cleaner to do it later. And I don't think... I mean, I think Littlefinger is more interesting if he isn't all-knowing and all-plotting uh, and uh, planning every move of everyone. I think yeah, it's he, also he, interesting when he has some actually uh, spontaneous reactions. Yeah, he's definitely yeah. not all-knowing. Yeah, those are my least favorite theories. Yeah, no, like the... People who put him on such like a high pedestal annoy me in terms of his manip- manipulation. So, because of this chapter, we learned that he's been like kind of an agent of chaos, right? Like, kind of just sowing deceptions here and there. Mm-hmm. And we've kind of seen mm-hmm. this in the prior books. What is his role moving forward? I mean, do it, have any of you guys read the Elaine chapter for wins? Yes. Mm-hmm. Spoiler yeah. alert. Well, no, I mean, we can't, we won't there's, discuss it if... Uh, yeah, there's, uh, and, yes, there's not that much mention. I have to, obviously. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what, like, what is his deal going to be, like, just ma- the management and overseeing of the veil? Like, it seems like that's what he's aiming to do, and then, like, corner the market to make more money, like, in other places by telling people what to sell and what to hoard, so he can play, like, options against other people to make money over the winter. It just doesn't seem like it just doesn't seem I don't know little fingerish enough. <laughs> okay, so no yeah. no choice show spoilers, but I think it's fair to say most people have seen season one of mm-hmm. the show, which is very much like the book, except for the scene that he and Barris have in the throne room together, and I think that is indicative of him. It's his, that's his goal, his motivation, his long game is the Iron Throne. So. I just feel like everything that he does is moving that way. 
Right. No, I don't think his aim is the Iron Throne. I mean, we we haven't seen him make any moves towards taking control of like he has no hope of taking the Iron Throne for himself. And he, if he right. hadn't, if he wanted to control the Iron Throne, he wouldn't have brought it with the Tyrells to kill Joffrey. Like Peter already had a hold over Joffrey. Why would he kill him if he wanted to influence like? the small council or or Westeros as a whole. Like I think he is his his we don't understand his motivations really, other than he wants cats. That that's his that's and the, then the main driving motivation. Yeah, exactly. Because it would, it would he cause more power, chaos for him to does, climb. Yeah, yeah, I mean he even if he's not a grip on and Joffrey, he, already, he still has to have him oh, out of the way. Oh. I think he probably wants money, which he's getting a lot of because he has Harren Hall and the Vale now. Yeah, but what is he going to do with money? I, don't, I, don't, I mean, I guess I just don't... Like, is he going to be, like, the the guy, like, holding, like, all the gold bags on the sinking ship and being like, yay, I won? Yes. I mean, I think... <laughs> as long as he had Sansa on that... I think if he had Sansa on that, on that sinking ship, he'd go down pretty happy. Yeah, exactly. I think he is... Um, most interesting when we think about his psychology and who he does everything for. And as long as Catelyn is alive, it's mostly for her, even though we don't understand all of it because he has a twisted way of thinking. And now that's, that Sansa is, is um, it replaced Catelyn in, in his head, uh, I mean, that's why that's in in my opinion, part of the reason why he plotted to have Joffrey killed. And um and I think further on, I don't know what will be the point of him I mean, I don't know what he will try to do, but I think the the point of him in the story would be will be mostly to um to for us to see how Sansa is evolving and how it, it will be a, like a mirror situation where uh Sansa has little finger to, um, I mean, it it will be really inter- interesting to see her in that situation with little finger and see how it, uh, how it, yeah, how it proceeds. Uh, I guess. Maybe he is the only one who can break a deal with the others. <laughs> That's what I was just gonna say. He's working for the Night King. Come on. <laughs> Who's the Night no. King? Come on. No. The Night King exist is a books. historical figure <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in the book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, his, his, his short-term plan is to is to just get control of the veil by marrying Sansa to Harry Harding. First, he wants to kill off uh, of Sweet Robin. Then he wants Sansa to marry Harry Harding. Then he plans to kill off Harry Harding so he can take control of the veil with Sansa. That's his, that's his like, <sighs> five-year plan. Yeah. Yeah, and mm-hmm. I think most of it is more about <laughs> about Sansa than it is about him. I, I mean, about power, truly. I mean, exactly. Like everything he, we, we have to remember that he was always. Uh, I mean, people looked down on him. He was never going to achieve anything. He was almost low born, and the. I think the most, the major part of his life was destined to show to everyone, but mostly to Kathleen Stark, or Kathleen, yeah, um, that she was, that he was uh, capable, capable, and that he achieved everything he meant to achieve. Um, and now he's trying to win Sansa in kind of the same way. I mean, it's all twisted, obviously, but... Yeah. I think that's a pretty good summary. I mean- yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anywho. Uh, for those following along at home, the next episode of the reread will be hosted by Bina 007 and will cover Sam 4, John 11, Sam 5, and John 12. And uh, those will be the end of our chapters from A Storm of Swords. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, iTunes, Twitter, and on our WordPress page, ukpodcast.wordpress.com. If you want to get involved in the reread, you can go to a podcast of com and join the forum. Thank you all for joining us. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Nadia. Oh, bye-bye. Yeah, thanks, Nadia, for hosting. <laughs>
don't have wins of winter predictions. Wins of winter predictions. I I even like stop thinking about it. I only think about it when I'm actually podcasting. Like, you mean publication Every predictions? Time I- yeah, publication predictions. Like, I have, I have no none anymore. Oh, yeah. Well, George keeps uh, the Hugo nominations are open, so he's going to be writing about those for fucking the next few months until the. <laughs> <you know. laughs> and then football the will come back, and then he'll be busy with that. Like he hasn't even had time to write about the New England Patriots getting beat in the Super Bowl. Like he hates them. I don't know if it's because he's a Giants fan like me, and also hates the Eagles that he's not writing about it. But like Jesus, yeah, guys, you know what? When whenever I talk with with someone who's like, oh come on, it's not a big deal, it's just a book, I I become all um, frustrated and like, but no, it's a big deal to me, and I, and I want him to write the next thing, and it's whole it's the whole show's fault and and stuff like that. Whenever I'm with you guys, uh, I'm 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 more I'm not quite an optimistic, but um, the like Matt, your frustration is almost. Um, a comic relief to me. <laughs> so. I'm glad you enjoy my suffering. <laughs> That's not what I mean. You know that. But uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, it's like I switch from one opinion to the other just to contradict the people I'm with. So that's about me. <laughs> yeah, I've just stopped caring. I mean, I still like the series, of course, but I just. Don't care. I started rereading the worlds of ice and fire just to get try to get like a little spark of fanboy back in. Really, this reread's the only thing that's keeping me going. Yeah, every time I, I yeah, read I... a chapter for the reread, I'm like, oh my god, this is so good, and I love these books. And every time it brings the frustration back. So. <laughs> yeah. Would you say Nadia? No, I was just gonna say, yeah, it's 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 only when I'm podcasting about these books that I think about when the next book is coming out. Otherwise, it's you know, it's been it's just been so long that I tend to forget there is a book coming out. Oh That's supposed. To- I know. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I'll I'll still be excited when it comes out, but there's no point. In- oh yeah, I'll go crazy. Oh, no, will you be? That, that that's <laughs> very. Uh... I I can't wait. <laughs> And now we have to wait a whole year for the next or, or the last season of the show to come out. Well, that yeah, I yeah, but yeah, I haven't season, I haven't watched I'd, the show in like two years, three years. I I yeah. hate this was season seven, seven, right? Yeah, I haven't seen it in three years. Don't worry, Nadia. They can ruin your uh, Star Wars fandom too. Apparently, oh yeah, that. I, I oh, heard about ways. that. Yeah, that's that's God, good. Damn it. Awful. <laughs> <laughs> we are so awful. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I actually like the all the new Star Wars movies, so I don't. I, I don't know. Right? No, I like the. I wasn't I the biggest fan doing... of Last Jedi, but I, I like that Ryan Johnson's doing like some stuff, but I don't want them to touch it. Yeah, exactly. I don't. I, I don't. I didn't like the solo pre uh, trailer. I'm. Yeah, I don't I'm more, have I'm more like, high hopes for that. It's like, how can you ruin such like a developed character through the books by doing a prequel? They did that with Anakin and Obi Wan by doing the prequels. Mm. Yeah, like why why couldn't they just do like a spinoff on Lando where it's like, okay, so yeah. we hear like a couple cool stories about him. He ends up being boss like in Jedi, and like I, I think that would lend more, you know. Yeah, I don't need the prequels. I'd rather see something completely detached from the main stories that's just in the universe. Yes, than yes, I, 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 agree. I agree. Do you know what I mean? Like, like even Rogue One, it was like, oh, it answers all these questions. And I'm like, yeah, questions Man. I didn't have. Yeah, I didn't have really. a second. I don't yeah. care. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that, that was a huge joke about like, you know, why would they have this, like, one unguarded exhaust port that could blow up the entire fucking Death Star, like... And then, like, Rogue One's like, oh, like, 
the guy that designed it was like really like yeah, I didn't know. need it. <laughs> that I mean that hallway lightsaber battle was awesome, but it wasn't long enough, so it's like uh, I don't care. Yeah, just care. just film that and show it to it and like put it up. Right, on yeah, <laughs> just the one hour of that, and then nothing yeah. else. That shit was dope. <laughs> yeah, I liked Rogue One, but yeah, they're gonna come out with a couple Star Wars like. Just uh, like you said, like within the universe happening at like parallel times or like yeah, that know, would be good. Like, that old would have been stuff, the but... place to do Casino World side story. Oh. That's your yeah. Your I, I really <laughs> forgive it that like I don't know how many times you've seen it, but like the second the first time I saw that, I was like, "What the fuck are you wasting bullshit? T- fuck That's you!" <laughs> like, the second time around, I was like, okay, I get it. It's like more of a, there has to be resistance everywhere you see it, not just like led by the Skywalker family. They're trying to expand like this use of the force and like the thought of like rebelling against like oppression wherever you see it. And it doesn't have to but, just be within this family. But that's my point is like, I would love well, we to see it. We always knew that. But in a standalone movie, that would be great to see. It didn't do much for me in the main movie i didn't need like you know weekend at monte carlo it no. just and it, i agree it just, it, the first yeah, time i'm just saying been, it, like it didn't have to be that as long as it was right and it was a little it took silly. Up quite a like quite a big chunk of the movie um yeah. it didn't have to be that did. again it's one of those things that was probably only you know 40 minutes but it felt like four hours it felt like yeah. i think that uh, the no. use of the force um i think I think the last scene with with that um, child using like a little bit of the force that that was a very powerful scene for me. Yeah. Like for you know yeah exactly. I didn't need the preamble for it though to have it have the same kind of impact on me. Could have happened anywhere. Yeah. Had, yeah, I could have had ten minutes of preamble leading up to that and had it be just as powerful or. Or just no preamble at all and just show that. And then that would have made me go, wait, what the fuck? Then you have your standalone casino movie. Mm. But I did still love the movie. So I don't want it to sound like I didn't. (laughs) I only saw this one twice. Whereas I think I saw um, Force Awakens like six or seven times. Really? I didn't. I didn't watch Force Awakens a second time because I liked it. And I knew that if I watched it again, I would probably not like it anymore and I didn't like The Last Jedi so I should probably watch it again and maybe I will like it I, I mean I have I nothing to lose <laughs> yeah I like The Last Jedi in time. more than Force Awakens really? yeah I, yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah me too definitely because it was it was something it like wasn't a Force... retread exactly the Force Awakens seemed too familiar like it was well it, it was a new hope so <laughs> yeah, exactly Strikes... right but the last Jedi seemed to move things forward. It was so Empire Strikes Back to me in so many ways. Yeah, it was very, it, I keep saying it was that. Still I should have just made these in the future. Hmm. Set this 300 years after all the Skywalkers are dead, so you don't have to worry about it. And tell hmm. a new story. That's fine. Hmm. Maybe it is 300 years in the future. You never know. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know that Leia can live through, you know, all time and space. So mm-hmm. maybe. Y- Yoda's was nine hundred years old. Like. Yeah. Explain Han Solo and Chewie. Well played, friend. Dude, well uh, played. Can we... <laughs> Um, not talk about this for anymore, and then can we talk about a show that I've just discovered called The Man in the High Castle? Oh, seen that. oh, that's oh, been yes. out for years. Well, I guess yeah, it's maybe two years max. <laughs> it's yeah, it's been two seasons. But the book's but... been out since like, the... the novel. Is... Been... I'm pretty sure that's been covered on the OK, right? Um, I think we good. tried to, the but book? then it's. I don't, or, I don't know. I, I think, think maybe Greg maybe did one during yeah, yeah did the during book, book I think I I don't mm. know. I mean the the book only covers the first season of the show anyway. So uh, well, the, um, I mean I haven't seen it. The show I only covers to, the book. So <laughs> right. N- no spoilers, but um, is it good, Hannah? 
So um, the, I won't the second say season's about better, it, except for um, it was hard for me to st- starting watching it, um, and it's why I avoided it for so long. Because I saw the trailer and I thought, oh, that looks interesting. But I have a hard time with people making entertainment out of the Holocaust. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> I just feel like it's weird. It's kind of weird. And it'll always be too soon for stuff like that. But I have kept watching it because I think it does raise a lot of really important social questions that transcend all time. I think they're always relevant. And um, and so it's just kind of interesting. And when you think about it, I mean, had a few th- pieces fallen into different places, this might have been the world that we were left with after World War II. So I also think that that's um, an interesting idea to explore. Although, again, I do still have a, a bit of a qualm with making entertainment of any kind out of the Nazi party. So I'm, I'm kind well, of, I mean, I'm, I'm not... The jury's still out completely, but I do... It is a good show, I will say that. So, the thing that I liked, uh, I think, was it Kevin or Matt that agreed with me that uh, season two is better than season one? Yes. I think that season one was very good, except it spent so much time trying to sell you that the world is... The Nazis won World War Two. They occupy America with the Japanese. Like, you know, there's, mm-hmm. you know, stormtroopers in the suburbs of New York City and swastikas on top of, like, you know, the UN building. And, you know, they're just trying to sell you into, like, this is how this environment and this world works. And once you kind of, for, for me, once I kind of got it, I was like, okay, I, like, I get it. It took me a season. Like, it, like, season two really had, like, a good, like, kind of plot that you know, happened within this world. Yeah. I don't all, know if you guys thought the same. Yeah. All sci-fi show, all sci-fi fantasy shows like kind of like they, they move along that trend because they have to spend the first season doing all the world building. So it, it, it's often the case that the second season is just better because they don't have, because everything's set up and you can just tell a story. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I think, um, who wrote that? Phil K. Dix? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They have a whole new show called Electric Sheep on uh, Netflix based on some of his writings. Electric yeah, Dreams. Le- electric Dreams. <laughs> electric Dreams. <laughs> electric Sheep. Now I want to watch that show. Well, I mean, that's... Well, the, no, because one, one of his one books of was uh, Do Robots Dream of Electric Sheep. Oh, Blade you know, I've never read anything by him. Yeah, so Blade Runner, what else was him? Um, Total Recall. Mm-hmm. We sell your dreams wholesale or something. Um, there's there's a French uh, edition. Uh, I mean, people that are editing books. That's called uh, Les Moutons Electriques. So that's uh, fr- that's electric sheep. No, I understand yeah. why. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm uh, looking at the call to arms online. It doesn't look like it ever did happen. Yeah, and I think it is just a touchy subject talking about, like, a Nazi-run world and, like, how, you know, aspects of the Holocaust, even though I think in this world the Holocaust is over because the, quote, Jews have been eliminated, but there's still, like, underground Jewish, you know, like, like almost an underground railroad in, like, America, and so... It's just the separation of other races or other people that aren't, you know, loyal to the new government and stuff like that. It's 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 interesting. But now um D&D also want to do underground airlines, which is a similar kind of situation where the civil war was kind of like it was never won, so the south is still slave states and the north I, is yeah. still I don't think that's going to so, go through. Yeah, I think there was. I think there was too what much was backlash. Called? Underground was it airlines. Okay, it was no, yeah, underground it was called, airlines. Well, I mean, yeah, I think originally it was called Confederate when the announcement first came out. Oh, the yeah, book under, Underground Airlines. Oh, they, oh, oh yeah, really? it is based on the book. Okay. Yeah. Um, has yeah, there I, been? I, hasn't there? Has there been any more news on the Amazon Lord of the Rings show? Because I'm really excited uh, about that. I know it will take a few years, but I mean, it was. It I was just, just want more Tolkien. Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't they think they're excited. They I mean, just had a really good um, little series that I liked, and then I recommended it to Greg, and he, kind of, he kind of was like, I don't know what I'm watching, but I like it. It was uh, Gods and Monsters, where they go through myths, and they have this like pretty cool animation, and like this like cool guy with an English accent like narrating everything. And they just kind of go through like common <clears throat> myths and like monsters and stuff like that. And it's only like six parts, but if they did something like that for the Silmarillion, I think it would be really fucking cool. Mm. Mm. I think they're planning to do something in the years before. Um, I mean, the question is, oh, I think what I've heard with prequels, man. Hold on. God. Well, I mean, they don't really have a choice in that; they can only kind of do prequels. Um, but um, I think what I heard is that they it, it was meant to be about like um, Aragorn previous adventures. Um, no. Or at least no, that was me before. saying. I think that was me saying that I would really enjoy watching that. No, but <laughs> no, I, I that's actually what I read. I, I'm sure about it because um, I don't think they have the rights to the Silmarillion yet. No, 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 no they, they don't. Did. They don't. This is so. Uh, so this they is are definitely allowed... going to be set somewhere between the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Hold or on even, to even, the even, interwebs. I'm pretty even, sure they. <laughs> I think it's going to be set. It's going to be about things that are. Uh, I mean, because they have the Lord of the Rings uh, rights, and in the Lord of the Rings, you have the appendix, and in the appendix, you have the whole backstory yeah, of a lot of characters, including Aragorn, who has fought with. Uh, I mean, he's fought in 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 he's done so much. in Gondor and Rohan and stuff, and a lot exactly. Before all of this happened. When he was Throngil and when he exactly. was in Rivendell, he, you know, he, had, he did some cool stuff with um, the Sons of Elrond and, you know, with Denethor. We could see like a young, we could see like a really cool take on a young Denethor before he turned into the twisted person that we saw in Lord of the Rings. Yeah. I think that's probably the safest guess that it's going to be around those stories. Yeah. But I want to see not... That sounds like a show that's going to get... Now, go ahead. What did no, you already find? <laughs> I'm really not that excited about it. I would be, but then The Hobbit was such a disappointment. And like, I yeah, really, really, yeah, really, really love The Lord of the Rings movies. They're like... They're, they're, an, an ev- they're everything to me. I love these movies. I love them more than I love the books, actually. It took me quite a long time to be able to enjoy the books. So, so I don't know if anything is going to... Really? Oh. Yeah, I'm sorry. I Actually, I have a theory about that. I think they are much more uh, boring in French than that they are in English because I read them in English this summer and I was like, wait, this is great. But... I've tried like a few times in French before that and never, I mean, I finished them in French once, but it like, it took all my, uh, <laughs> it took everything. Like I had to. Do you think uh, it was like some French translator being like, fuck the English? Like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't make know. this the worst translation ever. I mean, I, I really don't know, but like I had to, like whenever I go on, on vacations, I take a lot of books with me because I know I will read a lot. And this time I only took um, I, I mean, I was 15 or 16 or something like that, and I only took the Lord of the Rings books in French because I—that's all I had at the time—and and that's the only way I found to actually read them is that I had nothing else to read. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a bit sad. But I mean, if you but, think those are boring, try reading the Silmarillion. I am right at the moment. The well, Silmarillion isn't boring. It's not boring once you get past like. Yeah, a couple of chapters. Five chapters. That are like really, yeah. really, you just can't get to. Yeah, Wait, I, I never did. It's like the Silmarillion podcast. Into, like, myth- the, the Silmarillion podcast was the first uh, series of VOKs that I started on, and so it'll always have a special place in my heart. Oh, yeah. Shane I, and uh, White Raven <laughs> and Greg, and yeah, it was. I I still regret missing out on those. <laughs> because then my I think you made one or two, probably, right? Probably no, I didn't. I I had just had twins. I could not. I could not do it. <laughs> Why? Um, <laughs> <I> had, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, anyway, I still I Lord of the Rings um our Lord of the Rings series is probably still my favorite VOKs that I've ever done. Well, that's what got me really into VOK it was uh and got me onto the forums was post- posting in the Lord of the Rings like reread like recap and then I remember hearing Bina go like and on the forums Vali says I'm like oh my god Bina just said my name. <laughs> 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 oh boy um, I'm really really enjoying uh, Altered Carbon at the moment oh that's a great that's a great one too I'm like halfway through the series I yeah, post on too. the forums about it like yeah, it's the, fun. the set design is very just like rip off a of Blade Runner but uh, everything else has been really fucking awesome I mean you're the reason I'm watching it probably because I, I, I see new gauging interests uh Oh, it was uh, Adam, sorry. It was Adam, yeah. It was Adam. All right, so <laughs> it's not exactly thanks to you, Vali, but I'm going to say it, it is anyway. Um, <laughs> thanks to I'll VK. Yeah, I would have watched it probably at some point, but uh, seeing the podcast might Yeah, I keep about caring it. about it. Yeah, it was funny. Like My buddy called me in the middle of the night and was like, dude, you got to watch this show. It fucked me up get on it and like the very next time i log on to the forums there's a gauging interest so i'm like oh, okay great i'm starting it. <laughs> <laughs> i mean there are so many good things to watch so whenever you have something uh helping ke- helping you decide which one to start with it's like it's okay i'll take it if you guys are recommending it i'll take it right it's it's good to know every now and then it's like uh i trust your judgment so you know, <laughs> this doesn't sound like this might not be up my alley but if you're telling me that it would be then all right let's do this yeah, yeah. oh i mean like you guys wanted to do sensei and i cannot oh, be I more remember. That you guys got me into because i fucking adore that show mm-hmm. so probably the yeah. best thing i've seen in a long time me too yeah okay. so, yeah i'm glad they're doing that two hour finale thing I am too, but I'm so sad as well. Yeah, but also, I'm glad we're getting at least something. Yeah, I still feel gypped. Yeah, they really, they really need someone to finance that show. Yeah, every time they they uh, put on a video of of the making of this two hour thing, and every, I mean, the every actor is just you want you want to hug them. That's they. I just, I think that was you, Hannah, who was saying in the uh, on the podcast that you. <laughs> just wanted all of these guys to live all together in a big, big house for the rest of their lives, and like that's that's <laughs> what I want. <laughs> and with the actual people too, because they all seem so awesome. I mean, that show is just fuck. It's amazing, and like I know we were talking about this not too long ago. Uh, somebody was saying, well, they could have saved money if they'd shot it differently. And then I no. thought, yeah, but done it differently it wouldn't have been what it what it is mm. yeah you know no, but it's, yes it's, no. it's the deadwood problem like they could have done any other way they just need a financer is anybody excited for westworld season two <laughs> actually that yes. that i wasn't until that trailer like that trailer was actually pretty exciting Ooh, i haven't seen any trailer i need to get I'm to that. Not I'm excited. yeah i haven't seen the trailer either like, it, yeah it was on yeah, the like, uh, it's uh, it's other day there's a couple different ones. Has there yeah, been a the Super Bowl. Okay? Yeah, there's two or three. We did like a mid-season. Was I on any of that? I don't even remember. I don't remember. I'm, I, I don't I'm a little I don't wary of it. Yeah. yeah. Just because the original Westworld had like, a, you know, Western world, Roman world, and medieval world. And for whatever reason, the show decided to go into like samurai world. So yeah. there's gonna be there's gonna be multiple. So there was there okay. was a there was a quote recently that said there's gonna be like you know like f- at least four other parks like it, mentioned or shown. It's an amalgamation of Future World and Westworld too. Yes. Just from the get go, to me it was such a letdown. I did not enjoy the first season, so I no like, yeah I, season two. I do agree that the first season, like, overall, when you, like, look back on it, like, probably, it, it wasn't that great, um, but the... It was the very was, predictable, and, yeah the, yeah. the ending was still fun, and I would say, you know, once again, like, second season of a sci-fi show might be better. Yeah, the yeah. concept it may be... is funny of itself, but I, I feel like it could have been executed in 
any number of different ways and been better. Yeah. It made me really uncomfortable. So I think yeah. that was maybe. But for me, I had no brutal. idea. Like I haven't. I knew nothing about Westworld, so I like I really enjoyed it. Well, I knew I nothing about Westworld uh, uh, either. But like I was hooked, but at the same time I was like, mm-hmm, I'm not sure I'm enjoying what I'm watching. So I don't know. I will definitely watch season two, but I'm not sure. I'm, I'm really yeah. like I'm way more excited about season two of Jessica Jones coming soon. Oh well, of course. <laughs> that's, a better <laughs> show. that's a that's just a better show, hands down. <laughs> I heard Daredevil's I coming back too. It so so much. When when is when is Jessica Jones coming? I I, I love the first. It's, it's next it's next a, month. It's next month. Yeah, it's March. yeah a month away. Yes. Oh yeah, it's something. I I remember it's eighth March or something. I think. Yeah, it's, I think yeah. it's like March eighth or ninth. Can say isn't uh the second or the third season of Daredevil coming out soon too? I mean this I year. I hope so. I love Daredevil think, too. So I think it's the last one. So I think they're doing. Jessica Jones, then Luke Cage, and then Daredevil, over the course of over the course of the year. Okay. Um, I really I did enjoy enjoyed Luke Daredevil. Cage too. Yeah, I, I, but I think the first season was probably the best, like just because of Wilson Fisk. Oh yeah, it, it right. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the, uh, the, the first season. Was D'Onofrio the is. Yeah. D'Onofrio yeah, was awesome. Amazing. I did like The Punisher though, and I didn't watch right. the Punisher standalone Yay. series though. So. Oh, you oh, so should. Was that any good? Was it good? So personally, it's, I think I, I the really Punisher is the best. I think the Punisher is the best season of uh, Marvel Netflix that they've ever done. Really? I think it's, it's better so than Daredevil. Right. The Punisher or the Punisher and Daredevil? No, I mean the Punisher series, like overall. I think it's oh. better than Daredevil season one. Um, but so, that, I mean that that argument I, is I ongoing. I agree with that, but I feel like they they already. Showed you the origin story of the Punisher in Daredevil, and right, then yeah. they kind of changed it in the Punisher series. Well, mm. I, I also heard that like DC mm. is going to do something like that with the Joker. They're going to do Joker <laughs> before he became Joker, <laughs> while Jared Leto's still playing Joker in Get Suicide Squad. Get the fuck Squad out too. of here! They need to yeah. stop <laughs> making anything Joker related. You, you'll never. You didn't do enjoy the better. Killing Joke. You didn't think that was great. <laughs> What's so wrong just, with you? Yeah. <laughs> You'll never beat Heath Ledger as the Joker. You just won't. Did you like, see? It's just dumb to try. Okay, yeah. no. First well, of all, I thought you never beat Jack it's Nicholson. It's all about Na- Jack Nicholson. <laughs> first of all. <laughs> Second of all, oh, let's, did let's you see the honest was... trailer for the Killing Joke, Matt? Oh, I probably did, but it's been a while. It's fucking uh, hysterical. I, Go yeah. refresh yourself. I do watch all the honest <laughs> trailers, but yeah, Love it's been them. a while. Lord of the Rings was mentioned. I've been I summoned. Am really... <laughs> yeah. We moved on. We moved on. I'm confused. Yeah. When did Paul get here? A Paul arrives exactly when he means to. <laughs> I'm always here. What do you mean? We we were talking about we were talking about this the Lord of the Rings show, the the one that Amazon is developing. Yeah, Alex and I had talked about it, and the article I had read said if. Uh, Amazon might be looking to do something in the line of Game of Thrones, including sex and violence, and I'm just like, they Ooh. only get there's there's only there's only a chaste kiss on the cheek is allowed in Lord of the Rings. If it gets any yeah. heavier than that, I'm murdering someone. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, Zach. Elf boobs. Come on. Hey guys, it's Zach. It's, uh... <laughs> Zach's here too, man. Do, We're just lucking out today. I mean, do do elves even have boobs? I don't even recall uh, Tolkien making reference <laughs> to that. They have no genitalia. I mean, for uh, all I we know, think he made reference to that either. Anyway, <laughs> just had to put my two cents in. I'll let you guys continue. <laughs> Elf boobs. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Paul. I still like calling him Zach because they sound so similar. Does anybody on here watch Homeland? Yay! Yeah, not I since have... season three. <laughs> same, not same, not in a few seasons. <laughs> I am like not. I'm not excited for the new one because last season was such a bummer for me. Yeah, I'm like, not sure I'm, I'm really shocked. excited about Homeland anymore. I mean, season one was awesome, and then I just kept on watching, 
and they were and all then, good until it's like if you want to kill a character off, just fucking kill it off. Don't yeah, exactly. Exactly. Commit to something, yeah. you bastards! Like that's exactly why it sucks. Yeah. Did they bring Brody back? No, yeah. they well, yeah. They uh, they did they did and then they killed him. Like it was so. And then stupid. they killed him, and then they like <laughs> killed, they killed Quint uh, Quinn off, and then they like they qu- killed Quinn off, and then they brought him back. <laughs> oh really? Well, the, yeah, they yeah, put him in that so sarin cool. gas chamber or whatever. Yeah, right? dude. Okay, yeah. they totally like sarin gas his ass. He's fucking toasted. <laughs> like. They magically bring him back because science reasons, and then Ugh. literally, it's a like, good thing go you weren't in there for another season. forty-eight hours. Yeah, they go through a whole fucking season of like, well, he's you know fucked up, but he's like here with us, and like it's over the top nonsense, and then they kill him off, and he was like, shut your mouths. Yeah, yeah, I was like, not. Nah. I'm I'm gonna obviously watch this season, but I'm not on the edge of my seat. <laughs> when when is it starting? Uh, yesterday. No, uh, tomorrow. All right. Oh, well. So, day after that. Homeland is... <laughs> I mean... Homeland is the one with the CIA stuff? Like... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Oh, so I mean, there I was this... I just remember there was this... There was this, um... Very long rant on YouTube about... How they showed Pakistan on the show. <laughs> oh, Yeah. Yes. Well, that's why I first started watching it, yeah. and I asked you if you watched it, because I was curious to see what you thought of everything. Well, I, I have never seen the show, but they were like, yeah, they had people like going around on donkeys and living in tents, and like, <laughs> yeah, nobody does that. Right, I'm sure it was not accurate. <laughs> but, I mean, people do that, yeah, people do that so. in rural areas. Rural areas, people do live in tents. Yeah. And, like, I don't um, remember that, like, yeah, in the scenes where they just talk odd. Like, they, because they do have a couple scenes that take place, like, way in the hills on borders well, and Yeah, stuff. that's fine, but they were, like, even the cities were, like, north. Dude, they Pakistan were in, like, has proper Himalayan mountains. Like, <laughs> those aren't hills. Well, yeah, Pakistan has, guess, like, two of them. Yes, but it was shot in California, so... <laughs> Right, I mean, you can't... I'm sure it was filmed in California in the foothills. Yeah. Between the ends of a regular yeah. desert. Right, it's not like Sensei, where they can shoot on location. Come to Pakistan, shoot, but yeah. 